Good afternoon, everybody. If y'all could uh, go ahead and take your seats, we're going to call this meeting of the Smith Subcommittee of Judiciary Non Civil to order. And uh, at this time, I'd like to call on Chairman Setzler to open us up in a word of prayer. Chairman Setzler. Pray with me if you would please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. Lord, you're the giver of all good things. Pray, Lord, the God, that you would give us today wisdom, justice, and moderation in our deliberations, and that all we do and all that we say would be honoring unto you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see everybody out today. Uh, we have several bills on the calendar for our consideration today. And the first bill we will call, uh, Chairwoman Rich, are you with us? Okay, Chairwoman Rich, if you want to come forward, uh, HB 478. Mr. Chairman, if I may, before we get started, I want to do something. One minute, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, thank you for uh, holding on with us. I just wanted to take a moment to. Oh, this on here. Oh, this is it. I just wanted to take a moment and congratulate you as the uh, new subcommittee chairman in this committee. And uh, I think I speak on everybody's behalf that we are looking forward to some really good leadership. We've watched you just bloom, and it's awesome. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Montahan. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. I'm very overwhelmed. Uh, Madam Chair, hold on a second. I'm going to figure out where the podium might. Is it ready? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am bringing to you today House Bill 478, and I am working from LC 441884S. This is uh, a revision to our evidentiary code. Since 2005, Georgia has been unique in the country. We have two different standards uh, for admitting expert testimony. We have one standard for criminal cases and. Madam Chair, we're still trying to get the updated sub out to our members. Okay. So uh, if you'd like, just kind of explain the background of this bill while we're waiting on that sub to get to us, if you don't mind. Okay. It, not talk about the substance, just the, do you mean the procedural background? How, how did we get here? Okay. Uh, how did we get the here? The need for this bill. Okay. Yes, All right. So we have two different evidentiary standards in Georgia. We have an evidentiary standard for admitting expert testimony in criminal cases, and we have a different standard for admitting testimony in civil cases. That has been the case since 2005 when we had uh, an overhaul of our uh, evidence code. In um, revising that code, for some reason, um, back in 2005, I don't think any of us were here then, the code was written to include a higher standard, a higher evidentiary standard for admitting testimony in civil cases than in criminal cases. Civil cases require, like the federal courts, that scientific methods be reliable. And the standards are set forth in the code in 24-7-702. However, in criminal cases, expert opinions are, first of all, always admissible according to OCGA 24-7-707. And expert scientific evidence is only required to have reached a scientific stage of verifiable certainty. And that is the standard in Harper versus the state, which was a Supreme Court decision in 1982. The good news is that all of our stakeholders here from the major organizations have um, concurred and support this. We have uh, concurrence from GTLA, uh, GDLA, the Georgia Defense Lawyers Association, and PAC, the Prosecuting Attorneys Council. 
The only thing that this uh, bill will do is require the same evidentiary standard for criminal cases as for civil. So it's quite ironic that when we're dealing with money, we actually have a higher standard than when we're dealing with someone's life or liberty. This has um, actually cost us um, the taxpayers money um, in the past because of wrongful convictions. According to the National Registry of Exonerations, there have been at least 39 documented exonerations in Georgia over the past 30 years. And at least 25 of those 39 wrongful con convictions were due at least in part to faulty forensic science evidence. That means that 64% of the wrongful convictions in Georgia since 1989 were based on false or misleading forensic science, forensic evidence, sometimes referred uh, shorthand uh, by people in the industry as junk science. Those 25 people lost over 312 years of their lives and cost Georgia taxpayers over $6.2 million. Those costs in terms of life, liberty, and actual dollars could have been avoided and will be avoided in the future if we can apply the same evidentiary standards to our criminal cases as we do in our civil cases. Who's got number 25? Josh. Representative McClaw. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I also extend my congratulations and thank you for your indulgence. The chairman has agreed to extend a, like a dubious tradition by which uh, Representative Reeves, when he was subcommittee chair, allowed me to squawk uh, on his committee without having any voting power. So I happily fill that role again. Thank you again. Um, Madam Chair, thank you so much for bringing this bill. I think you said it best when you said uh, we, we protect money or money judgments with a higher evidentiary standard currently than we do people's life and liberty. Um, and so it, it seems to me to be an extremely positive move for the system and also symbolically a very important step forward to rec recognize, A, that we've had infirmities in the, the integrity of our criminal justice system uh, that we need to fix. And secondly, that, that we've got the will, bipartisan will as a body to do it. And so I'm super excited about this bill, and I just want to thank you for bringing it. Thank you, Representative McLaurin. Chairwoman Rich, in the interest of time and while we're waiting on the uh, sub that you're about to tell us about to uh, come up if you could just uh, basically tell us what the change in that sub is compared to the version that we have i think we're operating still off the old lc number lc 41 31 38 s okay that is a very easy question that is a simple change we simply changed on line 46 the year from uh, the effective date was going to be um in 2020 21, but it is now be 2022. Which well, one was that again? Well, on my LC, it's line 46. It's section three, okay. the effective date. And just to remind members of the committee, we're still waiting on the updated LC draft. It's coming in right now. Bear with us. Okay. While that's being distributed, I would just like for the committee to know that um, we have uh, some impressive members of our profession standing ready to answer questions. We have my former uh, evidence professor, Paul Millich, who is now retired, and uh, he was instrumental in uh, the overhaul of our evidence code. We also have some practicing lawyers here, um, some of whom I actually have litigation with as we speak, John Merchant and Ashley Merchant, uh, who practice in both the criminal and civil courts, who can speak to the different standards. We also have Mark Loudon Brown, who was lead counsel in a bite mark evidence case that uh, was ultimately overturned. Um, and we also have Don Samuel and Amanda Clark Palmer. 
All right. Madam Chair, if you want to call one of them to the podium now. Does the committee have any questions for them or would you like to hear from them? I'd, I'd like to hear from them. <laughs> Why don't we hear from Professor Mellent? Okay. Oh, and he is, he is via Zoom. Can you uh, all hear me? Can, am I being heard? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for just a moment um, of, my, of my time to explain how important I think it is that we go ahead and fix something that um, should have been done when we originally passed the code. But that was such a massive piece of legislation that there were uh, glitches along the way. And this, frankly, is one of them. And you have an opportunity now to fix something at really uh, no cost, because this is going to be, um, as some of you know, I teach judges in the state every year, and they complain about why do we have two different standards for expert testimony? Superior court judges have to apply one standard, which is sort of vague, the old one in criminal cases, and then they've got a very clear uh, standard for civil cases, but they're different. And there should not be guesswork and inconsistency with regard uh, to such a very, very important issue. And that is the reliability of the expert testimony that we present to our juries here in Georgia. So I commend the committee for taking this up and for Chairman Rich, I think this is uh, overdue. And I'm glad to hear that the stakeholders uh, are all behind this and that we can uh, make a, a lasting change to uh, an Evans code. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Which, which uh, number are you? Representative Sainz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Millich, um, you uh, taught uh, Chairman Rich uh, in law school. Can you hear me? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, and, and, and her, her, her as, a, as a student. <laughs> she was a very good student, of course. Um, I can't remember what grade she got, though. Well, we're, we're glad to know that the author of the bill has a good understanding of the content because of you, so thank you. Thank you. Chairwoman, who else would you like to have speak on this? Um, if... Uh, if the, Hold on, just a second. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I just, I had a substance of question for Professor Millich, please. Um, I just wanted to ask if I'm a, if I'm going to be a party in, in a civil case, I just wanted to hear the substance. Walk, walk us through the committee. I don't want to be guilty of glazing over the details. I, this, this seems like there's fairly broad support to this, but what is the substance of this change? Help us understand that. And, um, if you're if you're a, a party in a civil case or in a criminal case, what is specifically going to be different as a result of passing this as would would be applied today in that same context? Excellent question. And let's start with civil cases. That no change. The same uh, rules that have been applied since 2005 with the Tort Reform Act are still alive and well, and in fact have been unpacked and explained pretty well by our appellate courts. Um, unfortunately, if you're a superior court judge, when you have a criminal case, all that body of knowledge and case law during, dealing with experts from the civil side is useless. Um, you're going to have to use the old Harper standard, and there's a lot of guesswork involved in that. It hasn't been that uh, well unpacked. So um, the difference in criminal cases is there's going to be a greater opportunity to scrutinize expert testimony that's offered in those. Now, keep in mind that Dalbert has been around for quite a long time now, and courts in Georgia will, in criminal cases, be uh, able to take judicial notice of well-established, reliable forensic science that's used in criminal cases. This is not going to, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, this is primarily going to be used for controversial uh, expert testimony. Let me use an example, a microscopic hair comparison. Uh, you know, Georgia basically still allows this under very vague type of standards under Harper. 
nationally, uh, the, the rules with regard to use of that type of evidence are much, much clearer. And so the judges will basically be able to navigate this in uh, criminal cases the same way they've been able to do that in civil cases. Did that answer your question? Respectfully, no. I just wanted to know specifically, are we raising, is it, is it harder to get, intro, to get evidence introduced or harder to get a, a, a methodology, um, i.e. microscopic error? Is it harder to get it introduced as a result of this? It makes you bring a stronger game, as it were, to get something um, introduced evident from an evidentiary perspective? Does it make it easier? Just help us understand that. As members of the committee, I mean, our, our colleagues expect this committee, mem these committee members to understand the substance of this. And I, and I, I didn't, um, I didn't read all those cases you're referring to. So I just want to make sure I'm clear myself. That's, that's all I'm asking for. Professor, if you'd unmute yourself in order to respond to the chairman's question there. Uh, yeah, I, what we're going to see, I think, is a closer approximation between how federal courts and other courts, sister states, handle these types of new forensic tools as they come down the pike. Um, and I think that's going to be good for both sides in criminal cases. Both the prosecution and the defense have to deal with the issue of one side or the other bringing up new or controversial expert testimony. And so the whole issue here is how well equipped is that trial judge for navigating that question. And by passing 478, that judge will be able to fall back on the resources of that have been developed throughout the country, primarily in the federal courts in addressing those kinds of issues. All right. Madam Chair, do you have anyone else you would like to call? No. Not unless there are specific questions. I want to point out that this has been the standard in criminal cases in federal courts, including the federal courts that, that sit here um, since 1993. And also I want to point out that Georgia is by itself all other 49 states have the same evidentiary standard for expert testimony in their civil and their criminal cases. And with that, I, I would just ask for the committee's favorable consideration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent job. I appreciate your attenuation of this uh, huge issue that we have uh, before us today. Uh, is there any discussion from the committee at this time? Only a, a motion when appropriate. Signs. Okay, hold that motion for now. Chairman says. Mr. Chairman, I just wanna hear a plain answer about the issue of this. This is probably a great bill. I just, someone needs to say that it's, it's aligning with federal law. That's all fine. That's great. I'm sure it's a wonderful thing. What is the nature of what this does? Is this an issue? Does it, does it make, does it eliminate forms of evidence that have become dubious and can't substantiate themselves in terms of regularity and consistency? Does it create a circumstance where, does it change a, a, a standard of, of proof? I just wanna understand exactly what's happening and saying it's good and it aligns with other, I just, that's, I, just I think the subcommittee needs to, needs to hear that, that, that take it on in, in plain terms. That's all I'm asking for. Madam Chair. Yes, I'd like to start by saying, um, asking the question whether it creates a more stringent standard or a higher bar is an oversimplification of the issue. It, it's fact-based. Uh, I believe that um, a practitioner who practices in both civil and criminal cases and who has had to satisfy the different standards in the different types of cases, uh, maybe John or Ashley Merchant, if they are still available, if they could um, speak to this specifically. There are, it is just a different standard and it is 
a less reliable standard, the, the standard that we use in civil cases and that federal courts use in civil and criminal cases is the reliability standard that's set forth in the code. And it's just a different standard that is used in the criminal cases in Georgia. It, um, a more reliable standard is an evaluation of it. I just want to hear the, I'm just asking for the substance. This is, I mean. So the substance can be found in the code section itself. Um, and it is the reliability standard. And um, again, uh, maybe we can have uh, one of the merchants speak to this. Yes. Who would you like to call? I'm about to. John or Ashley Merchant. I believe they practice in both civil and criminal. John, Ashley, are y'all with us? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ashley, Go right ahead. Hi, how are you? This is Ashley Merchant. Thank you so much for hearing from us. So, so, uh, yeah, so just to kind of answer your question, the, the big difference is right now in criminal law, we don't have a reliability standard. We have that in civil. So when we're trying to admit an expert, the, the judge in a criminal case, they're the gatekeeper, and they're trying to decide whether or not to admit this evidence, but there's no reliability standard. All it says is whether or not it's reached a, a level of um, scientific stage of verifiable certainty. But the judge does not have to determine that the evidence is reliable and that the scientific method is reliable. That's an important standard. That's an important addition that we have in the civil code. So for civil evidence, it's got to be reliable. So all this is really asking is that in criminal, there's also that reliability standard. It's still going to be up to the judge whether or not the evidence comes in and whether or not the evidence is reliable. It's just adding that language. And so it's giving the criminal code section essentially the same that the civil enjoys, which is a reliability standard. So I'll, a I'll ask a question real quick. So what we've seen under the current evidence code is that less reliable and in some fact or some cases uh, totally unreliable uh, methods that are, I guess you could say submitted as scientific or reliable scientific methods. We have seen those admitted and this will actually create the correct bar for admitting evidence that has scientific reliability in the field has been peer reviewed and is in some legitimate correct yes exactly and it and it you know it goes for both the defense and the state because what happens in practice is the state if they are trying to admit evidence that that we would argue was unreliable then the defense is forced to bring an expert as well to show that it's unreliable so if this standard is adopted it would apply to obviously both and so the defense would actually not be able to bring in evidence that had not reach this level of reliability that again the judge gets to decide so this does not change the judge being the gatekeeper the judge is the one that's going to be able to decide whether or not the evidence is actually reliable thank you chairman says attorney merchant appreciate you being with us how does this affect experts themselves i'm i'm i'm, I'm i understand we're talking about evidence that's that's maybe physical evidence but in terms of expert testimony how is this changing the, the standard by which an expert witness that was introduced by either side would be evaluated to say this, this expert witness is deemed unacceptable, they're not truly an expert versus this one is? How does precisely does it change that line? I'm just trying to understand that from a, from a specific expert witness perspective. Well, it just depends on the expert witness. So for, it would really change it for scientific type, type experts. And I know that there's been cases where, where bite marks, for example. So let's use a bite mark, for example. Has, are, is bite mark examination reliable? Are the, the types of the process that they're using for that, is that reliable? That's the decision that the judge would make. So the judge would have to determine not only if that was something that was, was um evidence that had been scientifically acceptable, but is that evidence actually reliable? And so the judge could actually consider studies on reliability. Um, and, and so it does, it does raise the bar somewhat, but it only raises it to make it reliable evidence, which is what's important because we only want things that are reliable to go in front of a jury. What kind of things under this standard might not be acceptable versus the under the old standard, perhaps it could still come in? How would you, would you draw some a specific example of that? You I, I can give... Is, is uh, polygraph, anything like that? What, what are some examples? 
Um, well, polygraph is not currently admissible. Another, though, uh, another example could be false confession experts, just for example. Um, it would be very unlikely under this new standard that the defense would be able to bring in false confession experts. I mean, we might be able to at some point, but at this point in time, um, you know, could that, is, is that going to meet this new standard? That could be, a, could be a question of whether or not it would meet this new standard. Sometimes handwriting experts are another example. Um, we've, seen, we've seen issues with blood spatter experts where certain Certain types of blood spatter analysis are reliable and other types are not. The same thing with handwriting experts. Some of those have, have reached the, the, a level of reliability, some have not. So it depends on the type of analysis that that expert's doing. But what's important is that it still is going to be the judge's decision. So the judge is still going to be the gatekeeper to determine whether or not it's actually reliable. But there's a, there's a lot of evidence that, and it's evolving. You know, reliability is evolving. DNA is evolving. Let's look at DNA. Something that was reliable 10 years ago, uh, or was not reliable 10 years ago, may be reliable now because we've had advances in science. So by adding this, we're not saying that there's there's a, a whole body of evidence that's or experts that aren't going to be able to be admitted. It's just that the standard is going to be be this reliability standard, and it's of course going to be evolving. Thank you, Professor. Is there any other questions from the committee for Ms. Ashley? Representative McClaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to offer to Chairman Setzler, I, I think the saying goes wherever two are gathered, two or more are gathered with, with a lot of questions there, you have a Setzler subcommittee. So I'm, I'm happy if, if you want to get a beer about this and talk reliability, I personally offer that because I think it is a fascinating topic. <laughs> Thank you, Representative McClaw. Are there any more questions for anyone here for more clarification? All right. At this time, I'll entertain any. Uh, thank you, Miss Ashley, by the way. You've been very helpful. Thank you for thank your you. efforts, uh, especially coming as a, a member myself of the Defense Bar. You're, this is very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. I'll entertain any discussion from the committee. Representative Sains. The motion do pass. Okay. Any further discussion from the committee on this? Hearing none, there's a motion a second. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed no. The ayes have it. It does pass to a full judiciary non-civil committee. Thank, Thank you, you members Madam of Chair. the committee. Okay, next bill we'll call is SB 226. Uh, Senator Anna Vitardi, you with us? Senator Anna Vitardi, welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Glad to have you with us. Uh, we are uh, very proud to see you ascend into a leadership role being the senator from Harrelson County. So I just want to say thank you for thank you. Uh, having me today. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Senate Bill 226, I'm working from LC 413138S. Um, this bill came before the committee last year, um, passed with a friendly substitute. Um, just kind of hit the highlights. Um, this bill came to me and we began working on this bill in January of 2021 um, to address obscenity um, issues uh, with bills and online materials in our school districts across the state of Georgia. Um, the current form of the bill basically creates a complete resolution process for obscene materials um, that's adopted by local school districts and their boards of education. Um, once those complaint processes are adopted, basically it's creating an investigation um, steps for principals and administrators to carry out those steps uh, for the process. Um, the parents, the parents are to uh, hear back in terms of what is the resolution of the issue within 30 days. Um, and then the final section basically creates a transparency piece in regards to the materials that would be published um, for at least 15 days um, online so the public can review that um, as a result of whatever happens with the process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, any discussion from the committee?
And just for clarification, everybody in the Senator Anna Vitardi, we had spoke earlier in the day about uh, some date changes. Uh, those have been reflected. We're now operating off of LC 413138 S, or excuse me, LC 480511S. I apologize, Mr. Sherman. No, but that, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. Uh, bear with me, y'all. Do the wait, Bill. There should be two copies in the folder. There's the yellow one, but then the, the white copy is the one that's the current version. What's the four eight zero five one one S. We have extra copies if somebody's on there. Okay. Just for clarification again, this is LC forty eight zero five one one S. Okay. Uh, Chairman Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, thank you again for bringing this legislation. Um, will you go over the impetus for the legislation or the purpose or the reason you brought the legislation? I remember that being compelling um, the last time we talked about this. Yeah, I think, and, and I'm speaking as a former school board member for Paulding County um, before I became elected to this position, um, just in the sense of, I think, clarity for parents that may see obscene materials um, or materials related to books or online materials um, to have a way to kind of appeal and have a conversation with the school district um, related to those materials. I think from my perspective, and I'm only speaking for myself, um, I think you know the policy set up by local school districts sometimes can vary um, from school district to school district and not be totally transparent and not be totally clear. Um, so I think what we were trying to do is basically create a process that um, the public would understand in terms of where to go if there was a concern with material um, and basically how to go through about how to go about that process and doing that. Um, so the computer, so the community would have full understanding of, of, you know, the transparency rules of engagement with the school board. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and, and as a. Uh, as any good piece of legislation that um, survives um, the biennium, more eyes get put on it and there are more. Um, I've noticed that. <laughs> there are more opinions. Um, I wanted to ask you if you would be friendly to an amendment. Um, and essentially what this amendment would do would just to add a, a little more parent input um, during the process and particularly if you were looking on lines 48 and 49, let me see of the new LLC, LLC, make sure that I'm correct. Um, it would actually be um, under, let's see, Board of Education. All right, inserted after education, a comma, and the, the words as follow which shall also include the ability to provide input during the public comment at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Uh, and this was brought um, uh, to uh, further engage uh, the parents uh, during the, uh, uh, the process, the appeals process. And wanted if you just wanted to get your thoughts on an, any type of uh, amendment like that. No, I'll accept that amendment. Oh, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, do you have any further discussion on this other than what you've already presented? I, I don't at this time. Um, I, no, no, sir. Okay. Is there any discussion from members of the committee on the proposed amendment? Uh, who's 25? Josh. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And this so the chairman's asking for discussion on the amendment. I'm happy to provide it. And I guess maybe I could use that as an opportunity to sort of ex express a larger concern. I mean, I think one of the things that we should keep in mind when we have this discussion is that this is the Judiciary Non-Civil Committee. This is a committee that is supposed to handle changes, proposed changes to the criminal law. And if you recall, the history of this legislation, this committee was that originally there was a bill to exempt uh, or remove an exemption for library technicians and teachers from misdemeanor liability 
creating misdemeanor liability for teachers uh, if they allowed children to have access to whatever was deemed obscene. So th this is, we've, we've come through a process, right? And that process has basically been starting with a piece of legislation and policy that was pretty reactive and then moving to a place where the legislation appears to be more moderated, more tailored, more administrative, but it doesn't change the fact that we're still in the Judiciary Non-Civil Committee and that we have not spent the bulk of our time in this chamber focusing on education issues, engaging with teachers, engaging with school boards and professionals who deal with these issues on a regular basis. So one of the concerns that I, that I have, and I think this I can tie this you know, to what the, ch the chairman is saying about parent input is you know, when you change something, you have to look at the baseline. You have to look at what you're changing from to what you're changing to. And one of the things that I think is absent from this discussion kind of in the, in the same spirit of, of Representative Setzler's questions is, have we done a thorough evaluation of the amount of parent input that currently exists, the amount of administrative regulations that currently exists? I know for a fact that the state board uh, regulations require each school board district to adopt a policy relating to obscenity and harmful materials. And each, obviously each school board, which you've served on, which you know very well has discretion to implement such a policy. And then, Presumably, parents have some role in that policy. So I'm not at kind of, again, echoing Chairman Setzler, I'm not necessarily saying that I know everything about all those policies. But I know I represent Fulton County and have been and plan to represent Fulton in the future. And their school board is way on top of this, representing tons of students. My concern, and we all are familiar with the news, we're all familiar with the way that people are talking about schools right now. My concern is that we're using phrases like parent input or review or these like, well, we're just asking questions or we're just giving parents rights. We're using somewhat neutral or, or sort of benign sounding phrases to cover up for something a little worse, which is a more reactive, less informed, uh, basically manifested distrust for what our public schools are doing and creating duplicative, redundant legal mechanisms that provide parents, some parents, not all parents, with an opportunity to use school resources to chill teachers, librarians, media technicians into not providing a full diverse body of literature and education for public school students. So that is the main policy concern that I have with this legislation and a number of other proposals floating around. Um, if you could address that general topic and the idea of parent input, because I know that you would like to talk about parent input as well, I think this is the discussion, the debate that we need to be having, Senator. Yeah, I mean, the only comments I'll make, I mean, um, you know, again, I'm honored to be here for, in front of a judiciary committee. And if I, you know, as a former school board member, the vice chair of Senate education can fill the education gap here, I'll, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we can slice, dice and, you know, slice up whatever we want to define parent input as or make that hyperbolic. But at the end of the day, community input, parent, parental input um, is important. So we can turn that around and twist it, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. And I think why I'm standing here today is to make sure that, you know, we, we don't have uh, artificial barriers or rules that maybe aren't put in place to allow that transparency. And I think that discussion to happen in local communities across Georgia. And, and for somebody who, you know, grew up in DeKalb County, and I grew up in a, in a in an urban environment that was very diverse. Um, I, I, I think whether you're in that community or, or you're in Dallas, Georgia, that I represent today, um, I, I think the same conversation goes goes both ways. So um, I know we had that discuss, discussion um, when this bill came through uh, the Senate, and it was a bipartisan vote uh, as it came out of the floor of the Senate. Um, and so I, I don't want to diminish that, you know, parental input at the end of the day is the standard that we should be listening to as it relates to decisions, um, whether it's textbooks or anything else that goes on in a school building or outside the school building that um, impacts uh, my kids. Thank you. Representative Bode, you number 12. Okay. And just for the chair to clarify real quick, we will not be taking up the proposed amendment by Chairman Burchett and sub uh, at the, today. Uh, Representative Bode, go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Senator, just like my dear friend and colleague, uh, Representative Josh McClellan, I have some serious reservations and concerns. Uh, I, I just want to 
just take us through a couple of lines, uh, such as line 23, uh, is and when taken as a whole lacking in serious uh, serious liter literary, artistic, political, scientific value for minors. And then when I jump down to section uh, three and four and five, it seems like to me that the school principal is going to be the only one that's making this determination. And so unlike the current statute where the local board of education is taking these matters in consideration, the local board appoint someone, a media consultant to look at this or specialist. We're gonna have a principal who's a non-elected official, uh, basically an employee of the local board of education to make a determination what most of elected officials make these determinations or if this was a civil matter or criminal matter, a judge would make that determination. So that's my first issue. My next issue is, why are we not engaging with the local board of education to make these decisions? Or why are we not engaging with the local school governance board or team assigned to that particular school to take up these complaints? We know that a local school board, a local school board or a local school governance board or team is made up of community, community of peers. Most of the time, a local school governance team is made up of the principal, parents, teachers, community uh, 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 stakeholders, and even students. Why would that not be a better determinative factor of what's obscene or not? Why are we having a principal to have all of this pressure put on them to make a decision about what should be in bounds as far as student learning and what should be out of bounds. So I appreciate the question. So the way I read the bill is that the elected officials in each school district, and there's, you know, hundreds of, you know, tens of school districts around the state. Um, and I think it's for each school district, those elected officials who are accountable to the people to set the policy. I think the administrators and principals are carrying it out. And in the bill, it specifically says that the principal or his or her designee. So I think it's giving flexibility to the local school districts to kind of determine what is that process, but also too for the elected officials who are being held accountable to the people that, I mean, one county may deem certain materials obscene versus, you know, a, another county. So it's, it's, it's keeping that aspect of local control. So I'm not really understanding your question, Representative. Well, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, indulge me for a moment. If you're saying local control, this is not a local control bill if you want a blanket piece of legislation to control every state or every local school board in 159 counties. If we're saying local control, let the Board of Education determine how they deal with the books or with the materials in mm -hmm. their particular system. We don't need a general bill here at the state capitol to do that. The local boards have been elected to do that and they should be the ones to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman says. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would uh, appreciate the, the author. Um, and I wanted to address the, the, the author of the question specifically, let me take the, the claim that uh, that that uh, Whit Bodie raised. Um, isn't it true that uh, you know, we have we have a compulsory attendance law in Georgia? Kids have to attend school. We the, our constitution, in fact, says kids have a right to a free and adequate education in Georgia. And we've actually, as in my time, the General Assembly have been striving to exceed that to actually achieve excellence, and not just adequacy. Um, but what isn't it true what this does this does this decidedly does not take it out of the hands of locals this makes the decision the the the, the principal the the building leader's decision to take these questions is it not yeah and and, and if that principal is is uh has a good relationship is working with district administration which i think most if not all of our principals that's their goal you know in running their own buildings um then those discussions are are happening within the building and they're happening with leadership. So it's, yeah. it's a collaborative discussion. And with anything, uh, Whit Bodie would say, well, gosh, if the decision is the principles, shouldn't there be an appeal process? 
That's exactly what this bill does. This bill sets up a decision at the building level and the appeal process is managed ex- specifically with who Whit Bodie referred to, the school board. The, right. the school board is the appellate authority on this. So in no circumstance under your bill as, as it's crafted, would a decision ever get outside of the hands of the school board? Doesn't go to Superior Court, doesn't go to the legislature, doesn't go to the state school board. The appellate authority is set up because there's there's the decision and there's the appeal within the confines of the school board specifically in every single circumstance, does it not? That's correct. Um, so I just appreciate, I mean, I would actually agree with Whit Bodie on his underlying point. That's exactly where the decision should be made. And the appellate authority is exactly the school board. More importantly, the, the first decision is the, is the building leader. Let, let me ask you this, though, uh, to the author. Um, you know, this, this idea that um, it was raised that this is, the, this is somehow in response to a, 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 some criminalization of, of content. I, I, my, my, my friend, um, Representative McLaurin, raised that issue. I w- would, isn't it true, though, this bill has a fundamentally different premise? This has nothing to do with this idea of somehow criminalizing that. This, this recognizes... There should be a defined process that every parent should have, and that specifically the only thing that could ever come out of this is that the public have knowledge of the content that's in their schools. I mean, I would, I would ask members of this committee, is there any content, and I would ask the author, but I would ask parenthetically, parenthetically to members of this committee, is there any content in any school that school children grades one through 12 should be able to see that adult members of the public should not have access to know is being funded by their tax dollars. Do you believe there's any content that sixth graders or ninth graders or 10th graders should be able to see be, be, be sponsored, prom- promoted by the school right. that adults should never have access to see? Do you believe there's any such content? No, I, I think if uh, at the end of the day, I think sunshine rules apply to every aspect of government. Um, I, I think sometimes we either ignore, not maybe intentionally, but we don't see, we don't think about how that applies to the K-12 environment, but at the end of the day, I mean, those rules should apply for all aspects of government. And Mr. Chairman, if I could, could lastly, I, I do, I, I will talk to the author. I've not shown him language. I have spoken to council of a school, di- prominent school district here about addressing some of the language with respect to the copyright issues in lines 58 through 61. I do think that can be further defined in black letter law. Again, I think that was added by the author um, accommodating material licensing agreements that, that, that anything that would be highlighted that's subject to copyright, the author's underlying bill addresses that, but if the council's come to me and ask if in the deliberation, the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, could provide a little more detail to that and flesh that out in black and white a little bit more. And I, I would trust the author would be friendly to, to language that furthers the goal of this and specifies and ties down those those copyright requirements. That's fine. Yes. Chairman Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we really do have a great process here. Um, we get everybody's intake on a piece of legislation and we come to a ground that uh, maybe everybody doesn't isn't completely satisfied with, but uh, maybe everybody can live with. And I just want to go to a few points um, that I heard my colleagues say, um, uh, Representative McLaurin say, well, why is this in duty non-civil versus being in education? Well, the fact of the matter is this is a legal standard. Uh, I, I believe it's, uh, the, it's called the Miller standard. Uh, that's what is determining what is obscene. And I think that lawyers should put their eyes on that and, and legal um, committees should put their eyes on that to make sure that we get it right. And to tag along uh, on what um, Chairman Setzler and, and um, Representative Bodie said, this bill leaves the determination of what obscenity is to the community. What is obscene in Ware County, Georgia, is going to be different than what is obscene in Fulton County, Georgia. It's left to the locals to determine. What we're doing here is putting an outline in place that says that there will be some due process if a parent decides that, well, this book is seems to be a little bit uh, too mature for my third grader. We're putting in a process here that says, well, we have to meet these guidelines, these dates, hard dates to, to determine whether or not this is obscene. Uh, without that, we've had instances where a parent may come and say, 
you know, I'm not sure this is, this is um, adequate or, or correct for my third, third grader. And then this, whatever it is, sits on somebody's desk for six months or a year and doesn't get handled. So essentially, we're just putting in an, a, a set of guidelines so that someone in any community in the state of Georgia will have a determination of when they're going to have their due process to determine if it is correct uh, or right or obscene or not obscene for their, their child. That's the only couple points I wanted to, uh, to make, but I also want to thank my colleagues uh, for their input um, across the board, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Montana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Anavtardi, thank you so much for bringing this bill. Uh, I too, he, you're my senator, so I, I really appreciate you coming. Uh, I, don't, I feel like in this committee, I'm almost everybody's senator, but. <laughs> hey, listen, that's, that's great. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to kind of talk about a few different things, you know. I heard oh, we have an education gap here on the committee. I just went to Kennesaw State University in state school, uh, graduated from Pondy County High School. So I want to try to do the best rendition I can uh, of understanding this. But I think there was a Supreme Court justice that said at some point that uh, when looking at pornography, he knows it when he sees it. And uh, I would have to concur with him. I'm looking at some, I think it was Representative Karen Mathiak, who's in the back of the uh, uh, benches over there. She had a bill very similar to this bill uh, last year. We we covered it, uh, and some of the material that we saw uh, was, you know, I think, and I just want to make sure this is the kind of books we're talking about because just for the committee's sake to understand, I see one that has a uh, a title of "Porn Chic: Exploring the Contours of Ranch Eroticism." that is available to children um, or uh, Big Box of Secrets, a sexy BBW romance novelette from Steam Books. Um, I'm seeing another one that's called uh, The Secrets of Porn Star Sex, Brilliant Ideas for No Holds Barred Pleasure. And this is available on a service called EBSCO, Galileo, and others. Is that the kind of material that we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the reason I ask those, and, I, and there's excerpts that are so foul that I can't repeat them in this committee, we're not talking about it. Let's say a Disney movie who's portraying some innuendo where the parents laugh, but the kids don't get it, right? That's not the case here, correct? Correct. This is disgusting, raunchy filth, right? Correct. And so I think uh, with that being said, this is a novel and a fantastic approach. I wanted to clear that up, make sure we're talking about the same kind of material. And since we are, I agree with you. And, uh, and I, I, I fully support that and great, great work on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Representative Bird. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, thank you very much. I'm usually a little bit slow when we're listening to all these things here in Judy non-civil, but, um, does this bill do anything to stop obscenity in the school system? All I'm seeing is that this is to develop a policy to follow for school boards and school board members, that sort of stuff. So my question is, is this addressing the obscenity that we're talking about, what Representative Montahan just spoke of? I mean, does is any... Is yeah, that I mean, be this, addressed? yeah, at the end of the day, it does address. I mean, this, this bill is to empower parents to make parental decisions on be, what's best for their child. I mean, at the end of the day, um, parents should have the opportunity to communicate, appeal, discuss, um, you know, what, what is the literature, what is the, the information, what is being communicated within the walls of their school district and outside their school districts. Um, that impact communities. And I think this bill furthers that discussion um, as it relates to obscene materials in the state of Georgia. May I have a follow-up? So have we, is there anywhere where we have defined obscenity? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, what may be obscene for you and me may be different for someone right. else. So is there gonna be some sort of definition or determination for schools? I think, yeah, I think 
the the answer to that question going back to represent McLaren's question and, and others on the committee is that I think this bill is giving that decision to local school district to decide um, how they go about that process in defining obscene obscene materials at the end of the day. So um, I, again, we're, we're trying to empower parents to make the best decisions for them, uh, for their families and their kids. Um, you know, what you know, you may think is obscene in, in my household is maybe a little bit different depending on which Disney show you're watching. But um, I think at the end of the day, our, our goal is to, you know, eliminate uh, things that parents don't want to see. Uh, Chairman Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Bird, I was going to chime in here. Um, if you look at on lines um, 16 through 24, that's the that's essentially the Miller test. And that's that's what we don't want to get into the the uh, business of determining what is obscene in the entire state. We want each an individual um, board of education and, uh, to determine what is obscene in their community. Um, that's the that's the whole purpose, and that's what we're um, our our counterparts uh, on the opposite side of of our arguing that we're taking the local control route uh, out of out of the. Uh, hands of the locals but in in actuality we are determining uh, just a process uh, so that they can determine what is obscene and so that's the test that they will use to determine what what is obscene uh, because like we've said over and over again that is a uh, a moving target depending on where where you live let's see representative Kendrick Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, it looks like this bill is a solution looking for a problem. What I'm worried about is, um, and maybe we can hear from if, if the chair allows from people who are actually on the ground in education around what other policies already exist around this, because I, I can't imagine that there's not something, either a professional standard or something that already exists for this process. And I know we get very happy down here when something, somebody brings something to us that we feel like we need to pass a piece of legislation. But if we already have something in place, I would like to know what that piece is and how that differs from that bill. So is, is there a way to hear from anybody who knows that there is something that is similar or already existing out there or, or are you claiming that there is absolutely nothing even remotely similar to a process for, um, for this piece of legislation? Yeah, I, I can only speak, I'll speak to the school district that I represented or others in my district. I mean, I think the, the processes that are set up are very informal and not very clear to the public. So um, what we're presenting today formally um, as it is in this bill, it does not exist. There may be more, or you know, depending on what local school districts are doing. But it and uh, as it relates to what, what I've experienced as a school board member, this process does not exist. Thus, the need for the bill. And so, you're saying you're stating, in your opinion, you do not believe there's another system set up to address exactly what you're trying to address it. No, I'm, I'm only speaking for the districts that I represent and the school board that I sat on. If there, if there are other school districts and, you know, they feel like they're addressing it. I, I, I'm not going to speak for the other school districts. If they're here, I'm sure they, they would love to weigh in on this issue. Well, other school districts also, uh, I know that there are a different professional uh, standard councils that govern the whole mm -hmm. state. So not even other school districts. Like, is right. there a statewide initiative that already can take care of the problem that you're trying to address in that bill? That's what I'm trying to get at. It does something like that already exists. And I don't know if there's somebody here who can definitively answer that, but I don't want to create legislation where it's something already exists. Okay. Uh, Senator Ann Bertardi, at this time, uh, we're going to hear from the audience. We have some people signed up. Uh, Chairman Sachs, so if you'll hold that and we'll I'll allow for discussion after we hear from the audience. I believe we have Ms. Gretchen Walton from Cobb County Schools with us. Sorry, 
Okay. 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 Thank you. Moving on. Uh, Margaret, and I apologize. I'm from Harrelson County. I can't pronounce too many uh, <laughs> names like this. But uh, Miss Margaret Sicarelli. Chickler. Okay, I was close. Uh, if you uh, come over here to the podium or the table. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Margaret Ciccarelli from PAGE, the Professional Association of Georgia Educators, representing about 93,000 educators statewide, everybody from classroom teachers, superintendents, school bus drivers, et cetera. Um, regardless of how this bill wound up in this committee, we are very appreciative of the changes that it has undergone throughout the process. Um, and we, um, I was gonna wave, but since I'm up here anyway, I just wanted to say we do have a small concern about copyright issues. Um, Georgia public educators are pro parental transparency and want uh, the public particularly parents to be knowledgeable about what their kids are learning. And I say that as a, as a public education parent myself. Um, so if we can address that copyright issue um, through the lens of not getting schools in legal trouble, but making sure that parents have access to view the material, that would be the ideal way to thread the needle on this legislation. And we look forward to continuing to work with the author and this committee as we have worked on it as it has um, undergone the legal process thus far. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe we also have Brother Mike Griffin from Georgia Baptist Association here that wants to speak yes. about the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Mike Griffin. I am the Public Affairs Representative with the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. And uh, we represent approximately 1.3 million Georgians and up to uh, 3,600 uh, Georgia Baptist churches. And this last year at the uh, Georgia Baptist Convention, we passed a resolution dealing with our concerns generally regarding uh, the library uh, uh, exemption re regarding obscenity uh, in our schools. So we're very concerned about this, but we do believe that this is a, a very important piece of legislation because it, it makes a step in the right direction that I think that everybody should be able to agree with. And it's basically being a Baptist preacher, so let me give you three words to go with this in an outline, okay? Uh, number one, it's, it's about transparency. And again, if, if nobody has anything to hide and if there's nothing obscene, then shining the light on it is absolutely no problem whatsoever. Matter of fact, it will reveal that there is nothing wrong. But if there is something that should be dealt with, it brings me to the second word, and that is the word protection. We do have a responsibility to protect our children, the most vulnerable uh, that we have out there. Uh, Georgia Baptists were the only denomination that supported both hidden predator acts, those pieces of legislation to deal with predators. And uh, we're now concerned with holding a, a entities accountable. And one of the main things in dealing with uh, sexual predators and sex trafficking is the grooming process. And we're concerned that the over-sexualization of our children is, is, con is contributing to the, the problems that we're trying to stop. And so an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So the transparency, the protection, and then thirdly, accountability. Uh, accountability is a good thing because again, people that are doing the right thing want you to know that they're doing the right thing. And there's no doubt about this, that it does put that authority uh, in the right places with the right people, with the parents, school board, local folks, and to be able to display that out there uh, so that the community can see it and they can you know, affirm the direction the school's going or say, hey, that's something that we don't like. So that holds them accountable. I think it's a good thing. And I appreciate uh, Senator Avitarte for what he's been doing and his hard work on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Terrence Wilson signed up to speak.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Terrence Wilson. I'm the Regional Policy and Community Engagement Director for the Intercultural Development Research Association. We're an independent nonpartisan education nonprofit committed, committed to achieving equal educational opportunity for every child through strong public schools that prepare students for access to succeed in college. Uh, we are opposed to this bill uh, because of the threat that it poses to the access and use of curricula that affirms the identities of all students, particularly students that identify uh, as part of the LGBTQ community. While the bill drafter's goal of protecting students is laudable, the provisions contained within this bill may in actuality do the opposite. In fact, in operation, this bill threatens students access to materials that may eventually be covered and protected by the First Amendment of the US Constitution. While the bill's language appears to incorporate the Miller Standard as, as the chairman mentioned before, uh, this is a high bar. Uh, and we feel that placing the responsibility for interpretation of this high bar, uh, not with judges or other trained legal professionals, uh, but rather with local school principals or designees that aren't specifically trained to make these determinations is a problematic approach to these bills. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, uh, it takes an opportunity for lawyers and other folks to, to be able to set the standards listed here. Um, uh, we think that it's foreseeable based on this, this process that a lot of the information that would be protect that would be uh, prohibited might actually be information that is going to be allowable under First Amendment protections. Uh, we ask that the committee remember the words of the Supreme Court written in Aronosic versus Jacksonville back in 1975, which says that, quote, minors are entitled to a significant measure of First Amendment protection, and only in a relatively narrow and well-defined circumstance may government bar public dissemination or protective materials to them. The court went on to state that speech that is neither obscene as to use nor subject to some other legitimate prescription cannot be suppressed. Uh, solely protect the young folks from ideas or images that a legislative body thinks is thinks is unsuitable for them. Thus, we think that you all should re consider rethinking the wisdom of creating this system that will likely lead to protected content being restricted. Furthermore, beyond legal considerations, we believe that this bill is likely redundant based on the current provisions outlined uh, in the Georgia rules and regulations uh, that, that are available for you all to review. As Representative Kendrick asked for, there are several rules that, that govern uh, these kinds of um, these kinds of issues, uh, specifically Georgia Rule 160-4-4.01, uh, which governs uh, instructional media resources. Georgia Rule 160-4-4.2, which governs instructional materials advisory committees to be set up that include parents and other local folks in, in the community. And uh, instructional material selection and recommendations found in Georgia Rule 160-4-4.10. These provisions value local control and include parents as uh, uh, an eligible part and important part of the process. Likewise, the current provisions value the expertise of our educators and our media specialists and our librarians who are trained to choose appropriate materials for young people to access. Finally, we are concerned that under the current processes proposed in this bill, materials that cover topics from minority perspectives and that explain and address themes uh, including racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus individuals and religious minorities may be removed or censored. Uh, we've seen this happen in other places uh, that have enacted similar provisions to the ones in this bill. For the aforementioned reasons, we ask that this bill uh, be withdrawn and instead legislators enact measures to bolster community-based approaches to ensuring that curricula and instructional materials affirm all students' identities. Thank you. I believe next we have uh, Noel. Oh, oh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Wilson, you come back real quick. Uh, Chairman Setzler. Mr. Wilson, thanks for being with us today. Yes, sir. I um, wanted to ask you, um, you know, our, um, I'm fond of quoting uh, President Obama, who said uh, an appeal to first principles is useful. It really gets right down to the heart of issues, and I appreciate his, his perspective on that. I, I, would, I would echo that. Uh, let me get right to the heart of the issue. Um, you know, we talk about the, you know, some folks have some details to work out on in, in the language, and it's very important we get the details right. But in principle, do you believe that members of the public, taxpayers, adults, should, should be able to have access to see all content that minors in our public schools have access to? Or, in, in principle, I believe that uh, parents should be a, a huge part of the process, and I believe that our current 
uh, regime that we have in our uh, rules and regulations cover that involvement and that that ability to see those materials. So I'm going to ask you an uncomfortable question because I want to go right to the point. And you partially answered my question, but you did answer it. Okay. Be very specific. Do you believe parents mm -hmm. ought to have access to every single piece of content that's made available to their minor school kids? Yeah, I, I believe that parents should should absolutely be able to understand what students are learning in their schools. Broadly learning, but specific on, on a content by content basis. Right. Every and single image, every single word of text. Should parents, if they ask and go through the process, should they be able to see every single thing that students have access to in the schools? Yeah, it, it is my belief that parents currently have the ability to be a part of not only what their students experience, their own individual students, but also a part of the process where, you, where we determine what students can learn. So okay. I believe that okay. they already have that ability. Part of the process. But so, so, so you believe today, well, it's, it's debatable whether they have it today, but I'm, it's, a, it's a first principle question. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that every parent ought to have access to see any piece of content that's available to kids, even if they may not appreciate the content or even if they're not the, the ultimate deciders on whether it should be there, should any parent be able to see everything that their kids can see? Yes, I believe that's already the case. So, 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 so you believe it should be, the, you believe that parents should be able to then? Yes, and I believe that they have the ability to do that under the current rules. The problem that I have with the bill is not in parents having the ability to see what their children are learning. Uh, it's actually the part in the bill that would prohibit and censor what students can learn based on these rules that are hard to interpret and that don't have the same processes where lots of different perspectives uh, are included. So if I, if I, me as a parent, I wouldn't want what I determine to take away an opportunity for another child in the school. So that's why we have a collaborative process as it stands. Okay, the, this, I'm not sure we're reading the same bill. I'm reading LC 413138S and then 413138S in nowhere are mm -hmm. parents taking away content. Well, it, only educators, mm -hmm. principals, and then people ultimately under the, the school board, the, the, the school board itself at the, the district level. Mm -hmm. or making those determinations under under the bill we're debating. So there's no issue about suppressing that. It's this is simply an issue if if you if you're reading this version of the bill is that anything that kids can see parents and the public have access to see themselves. There's nothing that can be said. They there, can be, hey, there kids is a can large... see this, but, but mom and dad can't really know that it's being right. seen. That is one part of the bill. There is another part of the bill, right? That would allow a, a principal, as you mentioned, or a designee to say that this bill is harmful to minors and for that, that content to be suppressed or to be censored. So that is a part of the bill that concerns me. That... Well, well, if, you, if you were a principal though, and, 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 um, and I were a parent, for example, and I came to you and said, hey, there's this content here that I think is objectionable. You looked at it and you thought, you know, and I wouldn't hold you accountable as a principal that every single book on the shelf of your school, you've read every word of. So I would expect, hey, um, Mr. Wilson, I've got this. Take a look at this. And you looked at it and you said, oh, my gosh, this is not consistent with the values of the DeKalb County Schools or Cobb County Schools. Thank you, Mr. Sessler. We're, we're, we, we think this is thank good catch. This, this is not appropriate. It's, this is maybe it was appropriate sometime in the distant past, but it ain't appropriate today. So it's gone. W wouldn't you thank me for that? Yeah, I, I would like for it to be a systematic process. Even if I were a parent, um, I would want every other parent that's like me to be able to have that same right. And so I think that we don't want it to be a case by case basis in terms of having different standards for different materials. I think that what we want to have is a comprehensive systematic approach, which is what is reflected in the current regulations. Yes, yes systematic and that every parent have that same right. And that's exactly what this bill does, that every parent in Georgia has that same right. Some districts might accommodate this today quite well, but every district does not. We know that. And we believe, as you said, every parent should have the same right to a systematic approach. And we talked about 180 different school districts. I mean, it's representative, one of my colleagues said before, it's, it's different every place. Why do, we need a, why do we need a common process? Well, this isn't being decided, I know you, you referred earlier, the legislative body believes it's obscene. We're not making those decisions. What we're doing is, to your words, setting up a systematic process that every parent has a right to follow to make this happen. And then to ban the materials is well, the part. Uh, no, but the school leaders are making those decisions. Not the parents, but the school leaders. The school leaders make the decision in every single circumstance. And to the point you agree that every parent, adults should have access to what the kids can see that's exactly what this bill does mr chair i think we may have a, a, a different um understanding of what exactly the bill does but thank you mr chairman for your questions
Go ahead. We've got another question over here. Uh, Representative Bodie. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we appreciate you presenting to this body. Now, you said something that caught my ear earlier about principles. And when you not agree that right now, even some of our Metro County boards of education have had hyper political uh, meetings where it has been disruption. Now with this legislation, that political pressure would now be on one person. Is that not true the principal? That is correct. And then the principal will have to deal with the fallout, not at a school board me meeting, public school board meeting, but within their office and at their school themselves. That is correct. Thank you so much, sir. Any further questions? Thank Chairman you, Burchett. Thank you so much, Mr. Sorry, Chairman. Chair, Chairman Burchett does have a question, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, just tagging along uh, what, what uh, Representative Bodie and um, Chairman Sessler said, um, you pointed out the um, current statutes, 160-4-4, and, and um, if I could read from uh, an excerpt from there, what it allows is development of procedures for the school system and for selecting material locally, handling requests for reconsideration of material. Would you agree that this is the same thing that we're doing here? Handling requests for reconsideration of material, but we are putting deadlines on those requests? Uh, it, it is my assertion, yes, that we are trying to do the same things that already exist in the regulations. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And and. At this point, the way the statutes stand right now, though there is no provision within law that um, takes away that decision from, we don't know who makes the decision now, do we? And which decision? Can you be a little bit more The decision specific? for what is obscene and what requests are, um, what materials are re requested to uh, reconsider? I believe that in that in that uh, regulation, there's a list of folks that are mentioned that should be included, I believe. So what I'm seeing here is that they are um, to develop procedures and school systems. So what we're doing here is is essentially in line exactly what you what you referred to. We're just outlining deadlines for this thing to be for these materials to be um, seen about whether they're whether they're obscene or not. We're not taking we're not changing anything um, subst substantively of who's making this decision. We're saying that the board, I mean, excuse me, the Board of Education locally must make that determination in a reasonable amount of time versus just, you know, letting it sit on someone's desk. Yeah, I, I understand. And I think that, you know, the opportunity may be there to work within the regulation, but it is our contention that this bill is not necessary and it may be redundant for, as you mentioned, because some of the rules are already there. So if the committee has a desire to protect students, which I think is laudable and we wanna applaud you all for, maybe it's an opportunity to go into that legislation, work with folks, as we mentioned from the Department of Education, other community groups to do this, instead of doing it here at the legislature. Well, very good. I appreciate you again for, for coming out here and yes, giving sir. testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we do have one uh, representative Montahan. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, for coming in and giving your uh, testimony. I do have a yes, couple sir. questions. Uh, you had spoke about the narrow kind of lens that we're looking through for the First Amendment rights of the children. Uh, you know, and, and I'm trying to find out where that's going to fit. And so, you as a professional, what what kind of books do you think should be censored? I think honestly, it's it's going to be a case by case basis. It's going to be based on what the student's level of development is. Um, I think the problem that I would have is is here from my perspective here, trying to predict what kinds of materials are going to be uh, considered obscene under this 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 rule. Uh, further question then, let's say in your profession, I know you had a, a pretty good statement on this. So let's say for an eighth grader. What would you say you shouldn't expose an eighth grader to? I, I'm an attorney. I don't feel comfortable speaking on what eighth graders should and should not learn. Yeah. Um, I think that we can have a process that's informed by child development, educators, you know, all the different folks that are listed. So I, I'm, I unfortunately cannot speak to what's appropriate for an eighth grader. Well, I am not an attorney, so I, I, I understand. Uh, what, what would you tell somebody who says that maybe the procedure isn't working. You talked about many procedures that are currently in code. You said, you know, these procedures are working, 
But I'm, I'm looking at, you know, again, this is accessible to an eighth grader. It says torture porn in the wake of 9-11, horror, exploitation, and cinema of sensation. Or secrets of porn star sex, brilliant ideas for no hold for pleasure. And again, even the chapter titles, I, I'm just trying to understand if as a professional, you believe that fits within the narrow lens that should be censored. I think that we should leave those determinations to the folks who are closest to school children. Um, I think if I had an eighth grader, uh, I think having things in EBSCO host may, might be a different determination as to what's actually being utilized in the school. That would be a question for your librarians and for your educators. I think also we just have to be aware of the fact that our students um, have access to all kinds of things via their cell phones. And so being able to um, determine what they should and shouldn't see, um, I think that it, it would be hard for me to sit here and say what a, an eighth grader should or shouldn't have access to. But those would be my considerations. I would leave that determination into the hands of the folks who are closest to education that can make those decisions. Our educators, our librarians, our library media specialists, uh, folks who could work together to do that. I mean, just one more, Mr. Chairman, if you will. I just want to kind of back up, Lance. I'm, again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm from Kansas South State University. I know, I'm, I, you know, some places, folks went to some bigger schools and some more. <laughs> knowledgeable places, uh, uh, from what I understand, uh, I thought it was a pretty good school, but just from an outside Agreed. lens, I mean, right off the rip, just off the cuff, I'm just looking at this issue from maybe a 30,000 foot view. We probably shouldn't have, you know, an eighth grader looking at torture porn, just so, throwing that out there. So I, I guess what my question is, is right off the rip, that is, you would say, Hey, look, we really need to dive deep into this issue and find out if an eighth grader needs to look at torture porn. Um, I'm just asking the question. I, I don't know if, you know, what the students should be learning. It depends on what their educators feel is, you know, they're responsible and they're at maturity level. Um, I, I would say that um, I think that the problem comes in and subjectivity, right? So you may have a closer, we may agree on something like torture porn, for example, we may or may not agree, but they're in practicality, but there, I think there are things that will be in the middle and we have, for us to have a process uh, that we can work together to understand what some of those community standards would be because subjectively leaving it up to the principal, I think is problematic because they, they may have a different view than I may have as a parent and it can go both ways, you know? So I think that's the problem that we should really be considering is who we can be um, bringing into this process, right? Um, to, to be involved with these decisions on the front end. So I'm sorry I couldn't answer your question directly, but um, that's kind of how I believe. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all right, committee, uh, knowing we have some language we're going to work on with thank Senator Anna Vitardi, uh, and thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, knowing we have some language we need to work on, uh, we will continue to work on this, and uh, we'll get us another subcommittee hearing scheduled so we can uh, get this rolling along and at this time i'm going to call hb 566 and this will be a hearing only on 566 and just to clarify if you were here on uh, 226 and you weren't heard today um, i will let you speak when we schedule the uh, next committee hearing thank you Okay, uh, Chairman Burchett, I believe we're uh, working off of LC number 480510S, correct? Which one did you say, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman? LC 480510S. Yes, sir. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee members. Um, I know that uh, sometimes we get we get very deep into the weeds on these um, uh, bills, but I think that's necessary in, in um, subcommittee and we parse out this language best uh, uh, so we can turn out a product that's perfect for the, the state or best for the state, excuse me. Um, House Bill 566, uh, I'm gonna give you a, an overall um, and 
this legislation is, is a piece of, of legislation that we're going to continue to work on, uh, but I want to present it again to the committee. Um, like I said earlier, um, we dropped this bill um, last session, had a hearing on it, and as it sat, there's been many different opinions as to uh, how to best um, handle the issue that we're concerned with. And um, as, it, as with anything else, when you get uh, multiple attorneys involved and you have many differences of opinion, and that's where we are now with House Bill 66, um, we've went through many iterations, but here's the, here's the example. And, um, and then I'm going to uh, let uh, the gentleman from my um, district that initiated this legislation come up and give his testimony, uh, and then we'll continue on um, uh, working on this piece of legislation. Well, here's the issue. Um, in the event uh, that there is a car accident and there's severe bodily injury, perhaps even a death, the, the, the instance that we had in my, in my district was um, there was a car accident and there was a fatality. And during the, um, the accident or, or, or sometime thereafter, um, the... Um, the victim um, uh, that uh, perished during the accident, the BAC was taken on the, that victim um, um, or party, excuse me, not victim, my apologies. Um, and then the other driver's uh, BAC was not taken. And so through litigation, uh, they were able to, to find that uh, and get that admitted, the BAC uh, from the hospital and found that the um, driver was um, under the influence. Um, so the problem here it comes down to search and seizure uh, laws, and um, we we can't put a bright line test into statute that allows for just a de the determination of probable cause. That's what continually comes up, and there's many uh, Supreme Court um, precedent out there that deal with this uh, issue. And we thought we had it whip with the language that we've got and this substitute. Well, as soon as we got over that, uh, what we perceived a barrier, um, you know, um, a very uh, intelligent uh, attorney brought up another issue that we have to get by. And that's the Georgia Supreme Court where um, we have uh, what is considered testimony evidence. And so this is where we are now. We, we've uh, crafted a bill that um, essentially says that when you have a severe, um, when you have a few instances in play, then there's, there is presumed to be the probable cause. And that is that if you have exigent circumstances, there's an emergency if the uh, if, if the officer presumes or, or, or smells alcohol and there is an accident, um, then probable cause would be there to go ahead and get the BAC and not have to go after the, um, um, go get a warrant for that. Uh, that. That's what we were, we were after. And I think that we threaded the needle, you know, fairly well here. Um, but then, um, just this morning, um, and I think, uh, is Jill Travis still here? She's going to come up and speak. Will you come up and speak to the, the portion you, that you found out this morning? Um, Jill uh, brought up to me a few minutes before this committee hearing uh, another issue that we have to overcome. And, and so uh, essentially what I'm trying to do is, is smoke out any other issues we will have with this issue so that I can get this legislation crafted and get to the issue that I'm, I'm trying to get to. And that's just that if we have severe bodily harm and there's an accident um, and you're driving on our roads that we can get a BAC of the parties involved uh, so that we don't have the instance that we had occur in my district um, for anybody else. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to open it up uh, to questions or uh, turn it over to um, um, the folks from, from back home. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions from the committee at this point? I see a none. Uh, I believe Miss Jill's here to speak. Well, if, sir, if you could just uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm Johnny Lamb. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm the widow of uh, the late Sheila Lamb. I'm from Lanier County, Georgia. Uh, my wife um, and I, we were married for 27 years and uh, we were high school sweethearts, had uh, three lovely girls, Courtney, Candace, and Cameron. 
My wife was killed by a habitual drunk driver and there was no BAC taken on August 25th, 2011. Also, I'm a, I'm a staunch advocate of Georgia Muslims Against Drunk Drivers and also I'm an honorary member of the Sheriff's Association and a constituent of the Honorable Mr. B Chairman Honorable Bichette. And I thank you for uh, putting this bill forward and all the co-sponsors. Uh, why am I here? T today I'm here because I would like for this subcommittee to, to hear me and hear all the individuals out there in Georgia where there have been incidents where uh, a fatality occurred. In my case, my, I'll tell you my story briefly in a moment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, my wife was killed on impact and uh, she was given a BAC at the mortuary by the Georgia State Patrol officers that collected the bus sample. To me, it tells me, yes, that has been objective. But however, the offender um, that killed my wife, he did not receive a blood test by law enforcement. He received the blood test by the hospital, which according to the uh, district attorney's office is quote unquote unreliable for state prosecution, which that's here and there. My, my take is it, it, according to the existing Georgia laws, we have the official code of Georgia 40.5.55 that says if someone's involved in an accident and there uh, is a fatality or someone has serious body injury, there can be a BAC taken. So the, the law is there, but however, the enforcement is very subjective with the current um, articles, um, um, Article 3, Chapter 5 of Title 40 of the official code of Georgia. That needs to be tightened up where if there is a fatality or serious injury, the law enforcement officer that responds to that incident should or must provide a reason if there is or is not a blood sample taken. To say, quote, um, um, excuse me, I don't think uh, blood alcohol, alcohol is a factor in this crash. That is very subjective. And therefore, the, the law enforcement, I know they have a tough job, but however, they're making decisions for the district attorney and for the judges. On the side of the road, here, if I may also give you just another scenario, um, a murder and a victim that is killed in a DUI, there is no different. They are deceased. The... The murder victim, the law enforcement officer, he comes up and he or she, he will collect the evidence. He will get the smoking gun, the, the weapon, the bullet for ballistics. In the DUI, if the officer arrives, he should get physical evidence. Where is there cans of beer or whatever land in the crash scene? However, there's invisible evidence. If he or she does not get the blood alcohol content within X amount of hours, you can never get that back. And I've been in that situation for the past 10 years and six months. To this day, I don't know why the Georgia State Patrol did not get a blood sample from the individual that killed my spouse. So um, if I may, uh, I apologize. I'm a disabled veteran as well. Uh, I was a county, county commissioner for uh, one term, uh, 2009, 2012. So this is very emotional for me and it's very, very important, this subject not only for myself, but all Georgians, because no one should have to go through the legal uh, battles, court delays, financial burdens that I had to go through to get to the point of where the individual pled guilty. Two years and 11 months that it took me to get to that point. That was a lot of frustration, excuse me. So I would like for this subcommittee to really review and consider this legislation and approve it. Um, so therefore, the law enforcement have a better mandate to take blood alcohol contents when there is a fatality or serious injury at a vehicle crash. Also, I've shared with uh, the Honorable Pichette, due to my late wife's tragedy, she was, she was headed to work at 6, 15 and 620 AM to Moody Air Force Base. She was a youth center um, advisor. 
Um, she was one mile from the gate and uh, she was hit head on. Um, she, she loved taking care of children. She was there for myself and the military families to help the Air Force Mission Readiness for Moody Air Force Base. So she played a big part into the kids' lives at Moody Air Force Base. But my point is, once this legislation is approved, I would hope and I would uh, seek that the legislation would be entitled Sheila's Law for her sacrifice and dedication to the military community. Um, I'm sorry. Next, um, if I may, just if, if if I may, just one second. Just just throw out some some data for you. This is verified data that I provided to the chairman in his folder, which I provided um, previously. The National Highway Sense, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration data in 2018, from 2009 to 2018, reflects 78 percent of Georgia's vehicle operators astoundingly receive no blood alcohol tests in crashes resulting in fatalities. Survivors do not get blood tested. The deceased get blood tested. Why? Why not? In House Bill 566, it emphasized law enforcement needs, if they believe or they have a reason to believe there is no alcohol as a factor, they need to put that in that report. And if I may, I'd like to show you this. This is a 266-page Georgia State Patrol special collision report. I've read it many times. There's no word in here why and why not. There was not a BAC taken. So basically, um, it is subjective. Enough is enough. We need legislation to make sure justice is done for all of our public individuals on the road and increase our public safety with the House Bill 566. And the reason why I said it increased safety is because right now, habitual DUI offenders is a vicious cycle. The system is broke. Case in point, uh, I'm aware of Mr. Chad Mickler. Uh, he was working on I-285. He was 21 years old and he was killed by uh, a DUI individual. And that individual that killed him got off on probation, probation. So therefore that person would be out on probation and then the cycle starts again. So we need to fix this. So habitual offenders are held accountable. Law enforcement have the mandate. They need to make sure that BACs are taken and if they're not taken, why not in that uh, legislation? Um, I'm, I'm closing. I just want last thing, if I may. Um, I thank you for your time as well um, to, to speak to the committee. Last thing I'd like to say is, is Sheila can't speak now, of course, but House Bill 566 is desperately needed to be approved of the committee for a final vote. Because driving in Georgia is not a right, it's a privilege. Also, if I may, to the board members and for the chairman, um, one last thing, if I may, if, if it's okay, sir, if I may have a display, I'd like to show, and this will, a pitch is worth, I'm sorry, pitch is worth a, a million words, if I may. You have this in your folders as well. It's, it says House Bill 566. Sheila's Law, my wife's first name is Sheila. This photo here is my late wife's car that was hit head on. So any reasonable person would assume there's something wrong with this crash scene. There's something wrong. This is the offender's truck that ran into my wife head on. Every day I, I relive these images because this is me right here in this vehicle as I came to the crash scene to verify that my wife was deceased. And then once I saw the crash scene, in my mind as a law abiding citizen and a military person, I assume all thorough investigations would be done for this crash. But however, it was not, there was no BAC. So if you would just, just, just take a look at it and actually it's in your folder and this, 
it's, it's horrible to, to have to live through that and not know for myself why there was not a BAC taken. With that said, I uh, thank you again for your time. And uh, one last thing I would like to pass on to the chairman, if I may. I have not rested on seeking better laws for Georgia for DUIs. And if I may, I'd like to submit this to the chairman because I have written to our former governor, Governor Dill in 2017. I have a reply here, which I'll provide to the chairman. Also, I sent a letter requesting why there was no BSC taken. I sent letters and requests to the previous Colonel Mark McDonald, the public safety commissioner. To this day, no reason, no answers why there was no BAC taken and why it was not in the uh, Georgia State Patrol skirt report. For that, I, I pass, it, pass this over. And I thank you again, and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, we're, um, we're a state of laws, and um, the uh, a fine um, troopers and public um, law enforcement, uh, they, they're bound by those laws. So we understand that the law is what it is and uh, that they can only do what they could do uh, at the time. So what we're merely looking to do here is try and draft a piece of legislation that one, um, adheres to the um, jurisprudence at the um, national level, Supreme Court, and at the state level. Uh, and also would, in a scenario like this, um, you know, bring about justice. That's what we're after. And um, I appreciate the um, um, committee indulging us. Uh, and Mr. Lamb, thank you for coming up. Um, I, I do, do want to hear from the, um, the opponents of the bill because um, we want to we make sure that uh, the legislation that we can uh, drop is a... Uh, piece of legislation that will be upheld we don't want it uh, going across the street and getting struck down that's the uh, uh that would be a failure in my opinion so i want to make sure we're doing it right and uh in the event that uh we can get something structured i'd like to hear it again if uh if we could uh, i'm gonna leave it at that mr chairman okay um at this point uh is there anybody that wants to speak against the bill or in favor or somewhere in between? Miss Jill, Travis, uh, Gacko, welcome. Oh, welcome. Happy New Year, everybody. I've, I have not, this is my first day down for the legislative session, so it's nice to see you all again. Um, my condolences, um, my sincere condolences. And I don't want this, my commentary to be seen by Mr. Lamb as any kind of um, edict against the right thing to happen. In my mind, the right thing that should have happened is that police officer should have gotten a search warrant and we wouldn't be here today. Um, and that could happen. That could have happened. This, the police officer that was investigating that accident could have gotten a search warrant. And that's how we, that's how we get evidence against somebody. There is a of course, the Fourth Amendment that protects us from search and seizure. And then we go to a judicial body and obtain a search warrant if there's enough probable cause for it. And then, then there's a case or there's not a case, depending on what the circumstances uh, show. I have to tell you that the only bill that I've seen is the and reviewed thoroughly, or not actually so thoroughly as I could wish, uh, is the bill that was filed, um, LC 412812. I did hear the chairman mention that there was a substitute today. I, um, I'm on favorable terms with the prosecuting attorneys and they were nice enough to share that with me, but I don't have not had enough time to take it all in and, and, and say that this all has solved all of the issues. I think the underlying big issue is presuming in any instance that there's reasonable call, reasonable grounds is constitutionally flawed because the ability to search someone's person is a judicial decision and you're 
conflating putting it in the law as an edict as opposed to a judicial decision that should be made. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't any way around that. And I did talk to, I would like to have further conversations and will have further conversations with the chairman. I'm also not a DUI expert, but I know a lot of them. I'm not a constitutional law expert, but I know a few of them. And I think that those, the, the, those issues is, are where there's some tears in this and um, I know this body well enough that you don't want to create a creature that goes across the street and gets struck down. I have had several lawyers um, look at this and say, yeah, pass it. We'll fight it and we'll win as, as drafted, the original one. Um, and I know that that, that that comes across as kind of threatening it, and I'm not trying to be threatening, um, but we do want to share with you our concerns and then, you know, that we're all, many of this, many of the folks in this room are lawyers and we can all look at things differently. Um, but uh, those were some of the comments that I wanted to share with the committee. And again, I, um, I can't imagine the pain that Mr. Lamb has gone through. And I know that all of you feel the same way. Any questions for Ms. Jill from members of the committee? Doesn't look like you have any, Ms. Jill. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has signed up to speak to this uh, prosecuting uh, pack? Would y'all like to come up and speak, Mr. Smith? Good Thank to see you. you again. Thank you, Chairman Smith, and um, congratulations as well. Um, here's the situation we're in. This the current version of this bill correctly states the law when it comes to the issue that's being presented about getting a blood draw or be when an officer has exigent circumstances to be able to make the request. What the issue that um, my friend Ms. Travis was dancing around is the interpretation that the following phrase has been given by our Supreme Court. No person shall be compelled to give testimony tending in any matter to be self-incriminating. And that has, been inter the, that has been interpreted to mean that even though Georgia law says driving is a privilege, and by, ex by using that privilege and driving on the roads, we have given an implied consent that when an officer has reason to believe or probable cause to believe that a motorist is impaired, they can make a request and ask for a sample of blood, breath, or urine or other bodily substance. Like several years ago in a case called Olivec, the Supreme Court read the word self-incriminating to basically mean in testimony to mean that request, that when law enforcement asks a motorist, even though we've said, it's my, I'm going to exercise my privilege to drive. And in the response, I'm going to give you, I'm implicitly agreeing that you can test me if you believe that I'm in an impaired motorist based on some acts or some, some other evidence you have. The Supreme Court has held that you can't be compelled to do that when it comes to breath. And then last week in a case, that case is called Olivec. And then last week, in a case called Awad, A-W-A-D, they said you can't be compelled to give urine. That basically any time a law enforcement officer compels or asks a motorist to do something, then that's a violation of paragraph 16. So that's, so 566, uh, the, is this bill, when it comes, when we don't talk about the constitutional issue. This is a correct statement of the law based on a case called Cooper, and other and and the cases that came after it. This is good bill. Prosecutors would support it, but the problem is is that it doesn't get us around the other issue. As you know, Ms. Travis said, pass this bill, and then the defense attorneys are going to be able to come in and argue it's unconstitutional. They've already got the cases set, laying out saying this is unconstitutional, and it'll get struck down. There's a second step, and we're hoping to be able to work with the chairman and others to be able to get you something that not only helps 
solve the problem in this case, but for the future victims as well. Are there any uh, questions from members of the committee for Mr. Smith? Oh, the, the paragraph 16. If you, you, that's what I was reading earlier about the testimony. It's paragraph 16 that's the, at issue. Okay. Georgia, the Georgia Constitution. Any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Smith? Looks like you don't have any. Thank you. Uh, anyone else that would like, that has signed up and would like to speak to this bill? Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this, this, um, this bill touches many different areas of the law and, and I've already started the conversation with, um, um, uh, uh, Representative Bodie and uh, Ms. Kendrick, if, if we were to, if we are to um, pass a constitutional amendment, we're going to need a significant uh, bipartisan support to do this. And this touches implied consent, not just in this case, but in every other case. So I look forward to working with the committee and um, those in, in both parties to see if we can find something, a solution to this problem. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. I believe that uh, concludes the business of the subcommittee. I appreciate everybody's patience. Oh, so I, we're, we're not going to hear that one today, but we will entertain hearing that. I need to get with Bill Arthur a little bit more on that. And, yeah. and so anyhow, uh, we, we'll make it up to you. So anyhow, uh, that that uh completes the business of the subcommittee we are adjourned